everybody. Welcome to In the Bag, episode 99.5. That's right, 99.5. You know, uh, Robbie is down at Music City Open this week, and we just wanted to be a real solid episode 100, so thanks for tuning in. Um, we reached out, you all asked for it. This is going to be a kind of like Q&A episode, just all me, all business Brad, all day today. So uh, thank you. Just thanks everybody for your support. Just really, I can't even believe we're almost episode 100. That'll be next week. And I know we've said it the last couple episodes, but it's kind of surreal. I really remember the the night Robbie called me and talked me through his original idea and like, hey, do you think we can do this? And we're both like, yeah, it sounds fun. I hope we can do it for more than like, you know, a couple months. And here we are almost 100 episodes in. So we couldn't do that with all of without all of you and your amazing support. So thanks so much for that. Um, thanks for supporting all the stuff we do. Thanks for supporting um, In The Bag merch and continuing to do that. I'll have some more to tell you about on that later. Um, thanks for using like Discard PM. Thanks for supporting our sponsors who support us. All of that goes a long way and just keeps us trucking. You know, we can make it to episode 200 like this. So um, and that's because of all of you and your amazing support. I love hearing from you all. Thanks for coming into the store. I met a couple of you at the grand opening, uh, signed some discs, uh, met uh, a few of you folks uh, that are semi-local. And it just, it brings me a lot of joy just knowing that you all just want to listen to us talk all the time. So thank you for that. Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of keeping the same format. So Robbie would typically ask me how my week was. This week's been pretty great. Um, been really busy anytime we came off the store grand opening last week it was amazing um again thanks to everybody that came out for that uh, i had a line out around the uh out around the store actually, i actually have my brixton card here for those of you who are watching uh video so we gave out these commemorative uh store brixton cards that brixton helped us create which is very cool uh for the first 100 com uh, customers there um great time so but it was really busy we were building out the space uh, the two weeks prior and you know we launched and here we are this week uh mco anytime we have vending um jason's hardcore focused on that and you know we have all hands on deck trying to get that out we got subscription boxes all going out uh this much subscription box is crazy so it's been a little little nuts um i've been here by myself uh the last two days uh of course i've had some of the other folks but jason's my right hand man he is uh you know, he helps me with everything. I couldn't do what I do without him. And it, it definitely, I always appreciate him, but I really appreciate him when I'm here doing old school. When I first started, I, um, I did all the customer service, I did all the packing and shipping for the most part, uh, with, uh, Carson's help at that time and, uh, still did my job as well as that was growing. So very cool. Um, but been very busy. I did get to, um, go and caddy for my, uh, son, Eli, he's 10. And uh, he did his first disc golf tournament this weekend, which is awesome. That was such a proud moment for me. He played very well. He ended up taking first in his division there. He actually um, was the third best score of the whole tournament, including all the other divisions. He played. He, he's ten, but he played in the twelve-year-old division, and um, you know he beat most of the folks in the fifteen and eighteen-year-old division, which was very cool. So very proud moment for him. Shout out Eli for all of your hard work. Dad's proud of you. Um, and then. You know, I uh, wanted to shout out another special person. Uh, I've been trying to get him on the podcast for a while now. His name's Cody. He's a good friend of mine uh, from back in Ohio. Uh, they just had their baby. Um, shout out to you guys. Congratulations. And I know he listens. So that one's for you, buddy. Good good luck with all of that. So happy for you both. So good, good, uh, good week, good vibes. And, uh, you know, ready to jump in here and uh, answer some questions. I'm very old school and I wanted this to be like kind of genuine. So I didn't really read through and i saw some of the questions but i didn't really think through any of them yet i went old school i printed some of them out here just so i had them i have questions from um the youtube channel um i have questions from both mine and robbie's uh personal instagrams that we had you all submit um i'm gonna go through them this won't be a very long episode um just want to give you again it's a true half episode but i want to give you all something because again we do support you all listening every single week so let's jump in First uh, question here comes from Josiah on YouTube. He said, Brad, what are, what are a couple of specific things I can work on with my 12-year-old son who just started throwing disc? I don't want to nitpick him and drain his enthusiasm. He's throwing very nose up and not getting much glide on his throws. This one's kind of very special. I guess, ironically enough, just talked about my son who's 10 that plays. Um, I don't know. I think 
I think the the hardest thing, but the best thing you can do, and this is just my opinion. I don't know if this is like technically the right advice, but what I've done with both of my boys and pretty much anybody that I've got into disc golf since I played is just it doesn't really matter at first what the disc is or what they should be throwing or shouldn't be throwing. Find them a disc that makes them feel good when they throw and makes them feel like they can really play. Get them a disc that makes them feel confident and then work from there. You can work backward. Um, you know, when I started, I th started throwing very overstable stuff. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but that first disc that I found, which was a buzz, ironically, and I don't bag one anymore, but when I started throwing that buzz and it was like kind of going straight with a little bit of fade and exactly what I needed to do and I was confident, that's when I really got hooked and started playing and felt like I could play uh, competitively just like with my friends and family that I was playing with at the time. So I think just find a disc that is like fun for him to throw. Um, I guess nose up. I think a lot of that kind of comes with, and I don't know exactly the science behind it, but I, I do notice a lot of like anyone who's like learned to play a f with or has thrown like a Frisbee or an ultimate before even kids just naturally kind of throwing, you know, whatever they throw. Um, it, it is hard for that nose up. They just want to throw up into the air. Um, I think kind of just maybe pointing out that, you know, they're using their legs more than they think and they're trying to push the disc out of their chest versus like throw it in the air. Cause I think as a kid and as adults too, when we're playing, we're like, especially if you come from throwing an ultimate lid or something like that, or just a regular Frisbee, it's more of like, you have to kind of give it that nose up floaty feel. And like they're probably, your son's probably seeing you or the, the people around you playing throwing and you probably to them because of your stature look like you're throwing way up in the air. Um, and I think if you can just get them that way, try to find them some lightweight stuff too. Again, you know how it is. If you feel like you have to throw something really hard, you probably throw a little nose up and up in the air too, just because naturally you're trying to engage your like upper body when in fact you need to be engaging your lower body for that. Um, find some uh, MVP. We have some MVP. We have a bunch of lightweight stuff on the site right now. Uh, we have diamonds that are really lightweight. Anything like that, a uh, Rolo would be a great one for uh, your son as well. Um, I think... So I guess to wrap up my point, find some lightweight stuff, find something that they really like to throw that makes them feel really cool and really good about themselves. And then I think it's very, it's easier to teach that way. Kind of like Oreo method style, if you've ever heard of that, which is you find something good, they throw, they throw a good shot. You give them a great compliment and you kind of just say, Hey, did you see how it did this? Um, you know, so you're, you're complimenting them. The middle is like the quote unquote critique where you're saying, Hey, you know, great throw. Look at how, look at like how great that flight was. You know, if um, next time, if you throw like with your thumb out a little bit more, it'll actually keep the nose of the disc down. You probably can get 50 feet further if you tried, but it was a really great throw. And I love seeing you throw towards the basket. You know, if you're just kind of like squeeze in those like little, little tiny incremental changes at a time surrounded by some compliments and some positivity, that's probably going to go a long way because I imagine your son's just going to feel really good about himself if he finds a disc that he can throw and he's going to feel really good that you think he's thrown really cool. Um, so give him that kind of like Oreo compliment to small critique style. Um, find a lightweight disc and find something he loves to throw and like makes him feel really cool. So Josiah, good luck with, with that. Thanks for leaving the comment. And that's what, that's what I would do. That's what I did with my sons and they, uh, they love to play as well. Um, and my wife, my wife couldn't throw for his bit at all when she first started but found her a disc that she could throw and then we built her game from there so um thanks josiah for that one we're gonna move on to the next youtube question i, I picked out two of those in my opinion why uh, this is from jeffrey say 5575 in your opinion why does west side disc get a bad rap i think their vip plastic rivals any other brand what are my thoughts um i'm with you i think west side has quite a few good molds like i think the underworld's like really underrated I think the Tarsus is very underrated. Um, now they do have some, I think, I don't know, with West Side, it's, they have some really good discs and, and the Harp, again, the Harp is West Side as well. And we all know the Harp and some of us love the Harp, some of us hate the Harp, but I, I really don't know why they have such a bad rap. I don't know if like just maybe their branding and marketing doesn't relate with a lot of people. Um, they do have some very obscure discs um, that you don't, Oh, we hear a lot from like um i know a lot of people like like the maiden and the swan um uh the shield even i, I think people like like those discs but maybe a little bit more classic they probably came and for those of you who've been playing for a long time don't 
fla- uh, roast me for this, but I think maybe um, those kind of are like right before the COVID boom, like a lot of West Side stuff. And then I, I guess when I think West Side initially, like I, when I came in, Nico was with West Side. And I think, you know, love, like, hate, and different toward Nico, I think he is kind of a polar, polarizing figure. So I think him being attached to that may have sh- skewed some people possibly. Um, so that could be one reason. I think that, yeah, they were really kind of like coming into their own, maybe right as COVID started or something. I'm not really sure I wasn't involved pre-COVID. So I'm just assuming there. And then they haven't really done a lot or like kind of innovated a ton, but their plastic does feel incredible. I mean, VIP, VIP ice, VIP air, uh, even t- like tournaments solid too. Um, so I don't know. And I don't know if it's more of like, um, if p- just people, okay, if they're throwing, if they're like an underworld thrower, right, maybe they'd rather throw something like a, a diamond or, you know, cause that's a little bit more popular or, um, so I'm not really sure. I'm not sure why I get such a bad rap. Those are just some guesses, Jeffrey. Um, that's just kind of what I, what I have always assumed. Um, but if you haven't tried out West side, I think, um, harp is solid. Like I said, underworld Tursus is solid. Um, there's a lot of great molds uh, within the West Side lineup. Just give them a shot. That's, I mean, we have foundation care now on all of our orders. So if you always wanted to try them and you're like, man, I don't want to spend 20 bucks on a disc and hate it. And then it just gets uh, put on a shelf or something. Uh, foundation care is included in all of our orders now. So you can just you can buy it. You can try it out if you don't love it. Um, within the first 30 days, you can uh, hit us up on our contact form on our website. And you can exchange it out for a, a disc of equal value that you know you love already. So. Jeffrey, thanks for that segue, but um, hopefully that helped some clarity. But, you know, as I say about a lot of stuff, if it's good, throw it. You know, who cares what other people throw? If you throw it well and it makes you confident with your game, throw it. So I'm uh, going to move on to some Instagram questions now. Um, I've got a couple, uh, quite a few from Cody Speck here. Shout out Cody Speck. Um, he had some good ones. I want to mix his in between. Um, I may not do all of these. Uh, actually, I will not do all of these, but I'll just, I'll, pick a few here um some from a personal angle some from disc golf some from in the bag some from foundation so a nice blend of everybody good job um so sean glado or san g lado whatever your name is sean uh, who are my favorite drummers and are they also my drum influences okay i love this one so my favorite uh drummers kind of have a few um I grew up listening to Blink-182 and Travis Barker. So he was always my, from a very early on, um, I, I would uh, go on road trips. I know I'd drive my parents crazy, but I'd take my drumsticks and I had like my CD player. Yes, I'm, that's maybe aging me a little bit, but I would drum on, I would pretend like the headrest of the seat were cymbals and I'd drum on the back of our van's uh, seat and on my legs and to, I could play all of uh, Enema of the State, front to back, all the drum parts, uh, so he was like probably my biggest and even to this day my drum setup is very very um alike or very very similar to his and uh you know and then also i guess uh trey cool from green day because i started uh listening to green day about the same time um so i think those were two very early influences and i think um as i got into different kinds of music i, I listened to a ton um i tip i typically really appreciate like metal and any sort of like hardcore heavy genre drummers just because of the technique even if i maybe not, don't love the music or anything like that um or i don't like particularly love the music i always can appreciate the drum parts so uh matt uh, griner grenier greener however uh you like say that from august burns red has always been a great i always thought he was great he's um incredible and i think just his um the syncopation he does and some of the crazy, crazy fills and footwork he does are just incredible. And he's very creative for music that maybe doesn't lend itself to a lot of creativity. He always finds a way, way to be creative. And I think that's what I admire about him. Uh, and also uh, Aaron Gillespie of Under Oath was a huge influence to me growing up as well. Um, so those are, yeah, some of my favorite drummers, some of my big influences. I have some others um, that I maybe, I have particular drummers that maybe I don't like follow too heavily or maybe don't even know their names but i always appreciate them but those are kind of some uh some bigger influence in my life that i always 
you know, I can always go back and listen to and just instantly transport it back and instantly love what they do. Um, uh, we'll do one of Cody's real quick. Uh, he said, he asked, what's my favorite activity that's not disc golf for my, me and my family? Um, we have a couple. Um, it's some, first of all, we just love being outside. So hiking, uh, going on trails, that sort of thing. Like that is, uh, uh, just being in the, uh, being the yard, doing uh, yard work, swimming in the pool. I mean, that's just, we're an outdoor family. That's just what we like to do. Uh, jeeping has always been a huge thing that our family loves to do together. So whether it's just like taking off the, the top on our old Jeep or putting the top back on our Gladiator and just cruising around, finding some back roads or even just doing, we haven't done so much since we've come to Virginia. We haven't quite found the places yet, but in Ohio, we would go off-roading and uh, do that sort of thing and that was always a blast um for me and my family we love doing that uh love hanging out with our dogs uh love playing board games um we always love playing board games but jason and his family and elizabeth and all them have really really sunk us down into some board games and like niche board gaming we really love that so wingspan quacks of quedlinburg those have been big hits in our house uh, for a long time. Um, Lords of Waterdeep is another good one that Jason introduced, introduced us to that we really love. Uh, Sushi Go. Um, we're, we're a big board game, card game family as well. Um, and then uh, we all do jujitsu, which is another big pastime of ours. My wife and I, uh, does not do it. Uh, she started at one point. She may get there eventually, but um, not quite. She's more of a, a yoga gal herself. Um, so, yeah. So we love to do in our in our free time. Speaking of jujitsu, uh, Big Papa John, shout out John, how's it going, man? Uh, he commented, "Have I ever competed in a martial arts tournament or match?" I did when I was younger, when I was doing more MMA and kickboxing. I did that for a little bit. Uh, did pretty well. Uh, just local things, nothing too big or huge or anything like that. Uh, as far as just jujitsu in my adult life here recently, I have not, I've been wanting to, um, I think if I'm being a hundred percent honest, I got a little spooked out of it when I uh, broke a couple ribs, uh, I think it was last year, maybe a year and a half ago in jujitsu. And, you know, I think any of you that are parents or fathers or, you know, are married or whatever can probably relate that, uh, those injuries become a little bit more serious when you have a, a lot of people relying on you to take care of them. Um, so I think that's, maybe scared me away. I do plan on competing in one at, uh, this year at some point. Uh, so probably before I get my blue belt, I have four stripes on my white belt right now. So I, I would like to compete as a white belt still. Uh, but maybe not until later this year when I become a blue belt, uh, hopefully. So not, not in my adult life, John, but hopefully soon. Let's, um, jump down to another one. Tony the Land Shark, how many distance drivers do you need? Easy answer, Tony. As many as you can actually throw. Um, but in a more serious, I mean, that is a serious response because, you know, if you if you can throw distance drivers and they're really doing something for you and you're really getting the distance and they have actual utility for you on the, the course, maybe utility is a bad word, but actual like real use that you can have, um, I think you can have as many as you really need, um, as long as you're not doubling up on stuff you don't need. Um, you know, it's okay to carry duplicate molds if, if they're really something you lean on, but uh, I don't think you should walk out with like 20, um, but just kind of depends. Um, for me, I only carry, I carry a, right now, I've kind of been slimming down my bag. I'll update it in Discard PM probably next week as I'm getting ready to play my first tournament back playing new London longs, you all pray for me on that one. Um, but I'm, I only have my vulture. Uh, yeah, I have a vulture, one vulture. I went down to one. I have a jawbreaker ESP Zeus and I have a halo Falcon from millennium. That's it. And you can probably tell if those are beef, beefier, beefiest for me. Um, those are really kind of utility. The Zeus, I'm actually learning to throw pretty well on like a flex line and get some extra distance. So it is actually getting me more distance, which is kind of nice. Um, but it's not something I really break out in a serious round or something because I'm still not completely confident in it. Uh, the Halo um, or the Helio Falcon that I have, it is pretty beefy for me. And that's more of like if I just 
if I just need that disc that has a lot of fade and the wind's not going to bother for me, that's the disc I'm going to use. And that's the only reason that's in there for me right now. The Vulture is really the only one that I'm using as an actual distance disc. And I'm only going to that versus like an Evader if I... I think the the Vulture has some straightness to it with a lot of overstability um, with the distance. Whereas if I'm trying to get like the overstability from like an Evader, I have to give up some distance because I'm trying to put on a more hyzer, if that makes sense. Um, but I think for a typical bag, if you're like trying to play tournaments and you really can throw distance drivers, I think a good rule of thumb is like just one to cover each kind of slot, like a overstable, neutral, and maybe slightly understable to understable distance driver. Um, and then if you want to double up on one or two of those because you don't want to lose them and you lean heavy on them, then maybe go there. You also can go the method of um, kind of like a neutral distance driver, a slightly understable, a really flippy distance driver, and then you can go the other way on slightly overstable and very overstable. Like that's the rule that I kind of follow with my mid ranges um, and my fairways. So Tony, really up to you, man. You just go ahead and if you can throw them, put them in there. But that's kind of my thought from someone who doesn't throw a lot of them. What's one form tip that has made the biggest impact on my game for performance or for fun? Uh, this is for Gus. Shout out Gus. He was an episode. Uh, he was on episode ninety six or seven, but he was on a couple episodes ago. Um, Gus, I think the biggest one that's been given to me that's made the biggest impact. Let me find a disc. So here's a sneak preview. This is one of the surprise disc that you may get there's a couple options actually in this month's subscription box but this is a olf from millennium these are one of a kind that they uh hooked us up with but anyway um for those of you who can't see me i want to do my best to describe this but robbie kind of i used to like power grip pretty hard and like really backloaded my grip and i was just playing with robbie one time um can't remember if it was a tag match or if it was casual or we were filming a video i can't remember but he was like because I would get a lot of snap. I have a lot of power on my throw, but it doesn't go very far. And like the rotation's not really there. And he noticed I was really backloading my grip. So he kind of showed me that. And I'm, what, what I'm doing right now is kind of barely pinching and gripping with my uh, pointer finger underneath and my thumb on the top. And I should be able to kind of move it and rock it back and forth. Robbie's like, that's the, the amount of grip that you need. You just kind of need to wrap you, the rest of your hands or, or fingers around for support when you throw. And like immediately, like within a week or so, I was getting 50 more feet of distance at least. It was just a very good tip. And uh, also like my hands weren't hurting anymore because I wasn't like squeezing it to death. And I think it's just that balance between like you want to have grip on the frisbee, you want it to pull out of your hand, but you don't want too much so that you're um, cutting off your rotation and your distance. So that's really made the biggest impact to me. And I think just another one, and I'm still working on this is I don't need to run at the speed of sound in my X step up in my quote unquote run up to get power. Look at someone like, like a Simon Lazat looks so smooth or uh, uh, Nicholas Antilla as well. I mean, some of these guys throw really far and really controlled and it looks like they're barely trying. So I think there's some, and I was talking to actually Joan about this this morning, even, it's about power pockets, about timing, and it's all about that. Um, so I think just kind of taking my time and being smooth, slow as smooth, smooth as far, I think that's a thing. Um, so that's there's a freebie for you, Gus. There's two tips that's really helped me. So uh, John Bro, J. John Bro, what's up? Uh, favorite overstable mid? Right now, my favorite overstable mid is the Quake. I specifically have a Midnight Flyer Glow Quake that I really love. Shout out GD, uh, DGA for that. Um, used to be the Bobcat by Mint. Um, I also, uh, the, the Nord just came out from Castaplast this week. And that feels really good. That may sneak in. Again, I'm trying not to make any changes to my bag right now, but that may be a contender for uh, later on down the road. But I'm really loving the Quake. The thing I love about the Quake is I feel like I can throw it really far it has a lot of guy, glide, but it still has those um, really beefy characteristics at the end. Um, so it's like a controllable amount of beef for me. Um, let's see. Um, Ira F says, new colorways of the V4. I can't, con I can't completely tease them. But what I will say is we do have more colorways coming out. 
uh one of them sooner rather than later we have um two maybe three more we have three more colorways we're planning on dropping this year at different times um i'll give you a sneak preview of the code names we gave them for when we were working on them uh for example um boba fett was the code name for the bounty colorway and uh top gun was the co code name for tundra so um we have michelangelo is a code name we have decepticon as a code name and we have bird boy as another colorway so those are kind of some i don't think i forgot anything no so those are some sneak previews. So make the assumptions that you may. I tell you, one of them is going to be completely not what you'd expect from us, but I think it's, that's in a good way. All the so actually, Kimberly, my wife, designed this colorway, and I expect it to the guys to for it to be their least favorite, and it was their favorite. So great job, Kimberly! And I'm excited to release that one. That one will probably be a fall colorway. Um, the newest one will be out here in a uh, couple months. All right, um, we'll jump in. We'll do a Cody one again. Um, favorite book that's encouraged my walk with Christ. So full disclosure, I I don't love reading. Um, I love the thought of reading. I love the information I get from reading. It's just always been a struggle with me um, with like focus, I guess. Um, so I usually do like audio books or I do a lot of like video, TED Talk learning, that sort of thing. Um, but one thing, and I'll show it on video, you can see how beaten up and tattered this book is. It's just a little devotional called Jesus Calling. Um, no matter what, if I feel like I'm in a drought from like, just like really getting into some like scripture or really like just connecting and taking that like quiet time I need in my day um, to be with God, like that's the one that always brings me back. It's very special to my family because my uncle, who was a very, very, very impressive gentleman, had a lot of, um, he's just a, a, a true Renaissance man, had a lot of things he was very good at. Um, and he was just a mentor to me and my wife, Kimberly. And this is a book he actually gave us before he passed away. So it's been handed back and forth to me and my wife, and I'm, I'm sure it'll go in my kids' hands sooner rather than later. Um, but again, it's nothing uh, like, I guess it's not like a, what you'd expect. It's not like this, like, crazy like revolutionary book but it's just something that it's just the subtitle is enjoying peace in his presence it's just like bringing things kind of like back to center and that's something that center that's what that book has always done for me and my wife so um cody great question i love that question uh papa john also asked uh has the has there been or will there be in the future a all business brad disc drop if i do what disc picture would i choose that's i I don't know. Who knows? If you guys would buy one, maybe. I don't know. I don't know that anyone really wants my face on a disc. Um, however, um, someone who was on the show a few weeks ago, um, he, he did a Sharpie stencil drawing. I don't know if this is going to show. Yeah. So those of you who are watching on video, I think it's pretty incredible. I think we need to drop that uh, stamp. I don't know what you all think. I, my favorite part about it is he even got my moles like in there, which I thought was hilarious. So love that. And uh, Elisha is who it was. Sorry, Elisha, I forgot your name for a second. Um, so if you guys like that one, let me know in the comments. Maybe we'll drop that one next. Maybe it'll be a me and Robbie character head uh, saying episode 56 or something like that. But um, that might be the picture I would choose. I don't know if there's anything crazy that I would choose that I think really like represents me maybe but uh maybe me as like a hawk or something that would be pretty cool uh what disc would i do man that's a tough one probably an envy an envy or an uplink maybe that might, i think that feels like me uh yeah probably an envy of some kind that i think that that would be great or hey maybe we need a butter boy butter who knows john thanks for those questions those are great all right let's look at um Nathan, um, he was on, he was, uh, Nathan's the one that made the, in the bag bend it bingo card. Nathan also still thank you for that. That was awesome. And incredible. Loved it. 
Um, he has a very interesting question. His question is, if you can make an ideal bag for me to tackle New London longs, what would it be? Or what would be in it? Um, I am getting ready to tackle New London longs in like actually next weekend, which is terrifying. Um, so I would have to almost I answer the bag I'm currently building. And I and I guess briefly, you all have heard me talk about my bag as in a, a nauseum at this point, but uh, at nauseum at this point, but you know, I, I think my ideal bag will look differently than most people's because I don't have the distance to try to like score super well at new London. There's a couple holes I can birdie. Most of them, there's a couple I can par, but most of them a bogey or double bogey is a par for me from longs. Um, whether the, there's like super long shots that are technical that's the hard part. So I'm actually kind of having to break some of those shot shapes up in two for myself. So I think Nathan, what I would, what I'm doing is looking at and what I'm working on right now is like, what are my like confident discs that I can do placement shots with? Cause of the key there, I can actually shoot pretty decent probably from new London longs. Now decent for me is like bogey average. So maybe like, you know, a break 86 style. I would be like shocked if I broke 86, like in a couple of weeks and uh, next week probably won't happen but that's what my goal is but i think i can if i play smart um so i'm looking for discs that are like neutral that i can really shape or just kind of rely on to be um be i guess consistent um so i'm really working with i've like i had like four fds in my bag i've narrowed it down to two because there's really only two shots from them that i really need um and you know even my mid ranges like I have like the, I have this vision hex that's like kind of my workhorse. It's very straight. I know what my quake does if I need to stay left because the key to most of those holes on the fr on the front nine is don't go right. Um, so I just want to make sure I have options for discs I can shape, discs that can be overstable if I need them to be. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go there and try to do be fancy and do a bunch of hyzer flips, which is what a lot of them you have to do, or do like uh, flex lines to get a lot of distance. That's not what I'm doing. Probably if I was being honest with myself, I should probably take out all my distance drivers. I'm not, I'm not going to need any of them and just really focus. The smart thing would be to take 10 discs out there because I'm not going to need all of them and to really force myself self to make good decisions. But I'm going to re rely a lot. Um, I have three envies in my bag right now. There's one that's really straight. There's one that's a little flippy and there's one that's really overstable. I'm going to rely on a, them a lot to get me out of trouble and do placement shots. Same thing with my mid ranges right now. Um, feeling really good with the origin lately. My in the bag origin is flying super nice for me, and um, gonna rely on that disc and my FDs and probably my um, what the thing I do need to work on. I don't have in my bag right now is a hyzer flip forehand that will go straight. Jason was talking about that the other day, and uh, I he was feeling really good about it. I feel like I need that disc as well. So uh, Nathan, that may have not have exactly answered your question. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be throwing a lot of origin, a lot of fission hex, um, probably some quake again to, if I need to get le uh, left, cause I need to stay left and not go right. I'm going to throw a lot of FDs and I'll probably end up throwing some, uh, vulture forehands again to get me out of jail. I throw some thumbers if I get in trouble there and I really like the vulture, uh, for that. And I'm going to rely on those envies, like every version of those envies and just putt well. Um, Corey, have I ever gone back to where I grew up and played disc golf? If so, what courses? Um, I haven't gotten to a lot. I've only played two courses, um, from my hometown, like relative to my hometown, uh, since I've really moved here, which is kind of sad, but one I played is called, um, so it's, it's forked run is the name of the park, but where we're from, we call it forked run, uh, forked run state park has a, 24 whole course it's a very odd number it's not even a 20 it's like a 22 or 24 whole course so i get to play that it was it was really fun um shot okay it, i would say that was still pretty early on so i didn't play super well and then i got to play a i believe it was veterans park in uh, parkersburg west virginia which is very close to where i grew up but i played play there with my buddy todd he was on an episode um and i got to play there with him so that was a lot of fun too. A lot of fun shots. Um, beautiful park. And they were really creative with 
how they um, laid everything out. I lost my era, my uh, factory second era that I love there and what kind of like forced me off of the era, uh, ironically enough. But those are two I played. Um, only other things I've done, uh, we've, uh, me and my family have like taken a basket and made some holes like at uh, friends' houses or our families' houses and played. So we've done that. But those are the only two real courses I've played, Corey. All right. Um, Daniel H. Disc Golfin. Is there a chance some further throwing players can be on the pod? Hard to apply 350 to my game. Daniel, love you for that. Um, yeah, we'll, we're going to get some uh, farther throwers on here. Um, I think that 350 ceiling is like where probably 80% of our listeners are. So we're trying to uh, uh, appeal to most of them and make sure we're giving good advice. But uh, I hear you, Daniel. We definitely need to get some uh, people that throw a little farther on here just for the other 20% of you. So 100% can do that. Uh, I know Brody is coming back on, so that would um, I'll make sure to ask him some tips there. And good for you throwing over 350 feet. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, we'll get some people on so we can give you some advice too. That we maybe we'll switch up the episode and have uh, Robbie throw and see if I can recommend for the bag. That would be fun since he can throw that far and I cannot. But thank you for the question. All right. Um, wildlife Skies. I think this was, yeah, Wildlife Skies. How would you design my own course? Well, I, I've designed my own course. I have a course on my property, which in my neighbor's property, which is great. Um, and I've helped my brother-in-law design one at his property. So I think, I think what's hard when you're designing a course, and by no means am I a course designer at all, but I like the game of it. I like the like equation of it. So you're always like trying to balance like flow, right? Of you know both the difficulty and ebb and flow of shots, and also like the positioning because you don't want to walk too far between uh, tee pad and basket. You want to make sure you're getting all the, all the types of shots. You want to make sure there's not like a ton of downtime and you don't want to be too short or too long. Um, so what I tried to do in my home course, I really wanted to design something that was hard for me or not hard, but challenging for me, but not so challenging that I don't want to go play it for fun and not have a good time. Um, I just really tried to use natural obstacles and OB to really give myself a lot of shot types. Like I think the only reason my forehand has improved like it has is because at my home course, you know, the very first hole was really a forehand hole because you don't have enough room to turn it over and there's like natural OB on the right. Um, so it's like off the tee or off of hole one on my home course, I have like a 275 foot forehand shot that I have to throw. Um, you know, and then there's like gap hitting, there's some distance. I have, you know, holes ranging from 160 feet all the way out to like 900 feet on my home course. So trying to give both short and long shots, uh, have a couple ace runs that are kind of fun, have a couple that are like almost impossible to par. Um, there's one that it's not impossible to par, but it's a very, it's a hard par. You can't mess up. There's like a 480 foot par three that you know if i'm playing with my boys I, it will make it a par four but for me it's a par three and it's just challenging to throw really good placement shots uh two really good for me two really good placement shots so i think you know you need to design something that you can have fun with that gives you all the shot types you know it's kind of helping me di designing a course has made me see kind of the difference between what a turnover shot is and a forehand shot like what makes the, what differentiates the two and make sure i'm having shots where I can throw low to the ground and th ones I can throw big sky hyzers and, you know, just all the different types of shots is really what I want to do. Cause I, if I have my own course, I want it for practice as well. So I want to make sure I'm getting a well-rounded round. I don't know if there's any better way to say that. So hopefully that um, answers your, your question and again, using T because I only have seven baskets, but I have 18 holes. I have multiple T pads. So, you know, I think it's fun. Chain, and I have multiple layouts too, which is great. So it's fun to do that and kind of think about things a little differently and even change up the directionality of the course too. Um, I think that's what really makes good course design is something that's practical, that is really sharpening your skills, but also fun. And you can play in different layouts and different shapes to really suit your game and sharpen your game. Um, Jolly0406 is how many aces have I gotten? 
So behind me, sorry, I'm looking behind me. I'm on my shelf. I got three discs here. I've gotten three aces. So this one was my first ace here. This is a banger GT. This is a collar shift banger GT from 2020 Ledgestone. So very fun. Um, looks like I aced this on 41421 at Kentwood, Kentwood Park in Raleigh, North Carolina. If anybody knows that course has been to it, hit me up in the comments. Uh, I stepped up. I was traveling for work. I stepped up to hole one. It was like 200, a little over 200 feet, pretty short shot. Uh, took this out, didn't do any warm-up, just went up to the first tee pad, threw it, threw it right in on hole one. And I was like, maybe I should just quit right now. That's I'm not going to get any better. And I proceeded to play a very terrible round after that. But got that. Um, this Envy right here, this Eclipse Envy, uh, 5, 5, 23, Timbuk, Timbrook Park, hole 18. Uh, Jason and I did an ace challenge. The uh, boys, Hunter and Trevor, did a see if they could both ace in 100 throws or how many throws it took them. I think it took them like a, a little over 100 throws. It took Jason and I like, I think, 91 for us both to ace. But that's what this is for. And then uh, you guys will remember me talking about my uh, S-Line FD. And it's not in the bag anymore if, more if you looked on disc RPM. It's because I got an ace with it. It was getting a little flippy, so I took it out. Um, I aced with this one on my brother-in-law's course that I designed with him. And uh, this was like a 280 foot uphill shot, very hard shot around a tree. And I, it came out of my hand. I said, that is going in. I knew it immediately. And it was so, it was hype. Um, both of my sons were there, my nephew, my brother-in-law. Uh, it was a very cool moment. So that was only ace three times. Uh, I've been close a couple more times. Timbrook hole two has my name on. I've changed, I've hit the cage on that twice now with my quake. So uh, hopefully more in the future. Let's see. DJ Ch uh, Chaplin says, what's my favorite moment experience while being with Foundation? Oh, man. That is a very hard moment. A uh, very hard moment to pick, I guess. There's been a lot of great, great moments. Um, I don't know. I'm always like really proud of Foundation as a whole, both our employees and our Foundation Nation and everyone that supports everything we do when we do these uh, Isaiah 117 house like live streams and we can donate like thousands of dollars to this amazing charity that's just helping foster kids, which is a very, very, very near and dear um, cause to my own heart and all of us here. So I'm just always the most proud of like our whole team and all of you in those moments. And we get to do something really good was something that we all love together. And I'm getting kind of cold chills thinking about. Those are always my favorite moments. Um, getting to hand those that money over to that cause, it's really, really cool. Um, I mean, I think it, it was amazing experience, um, you know, hitting 100,000 uh, YouTube subscribers. Again, I was like a small part in that, right? Driving the, all that to the end. That was a pretty incredible moment. I think... Um, looking at our Christmas party this last year and how many people were here and how like our, our team that we're building, but our family that we're building is like probably really amazing. And, you know, USDGC was a very surreal moment because, you know, I was just a guy that fell in love with disc golf and was working a normal, like probably not really a normal, not a nine to five. I was flying all over the place. I was missing stuff with my kids and my wife and, you know, I had, I had a dream just like everybody else and said, you know, I'll shoot my shot. And I talked to Hunter and, you know, next thing I know, I was a guy on the inside and I went to USDGC last year and a bunch of you like came up to me and said, hi, you know, and you love listening in the bag and your fans and you like people send notes and things in here and want me to sign their disc. And I'm just a guy. And I think it's still a little surreal and very humbling and I don't know. I always get reminded in those moments, like how blessed I am. And, you know, I, we always try to use our platform to for good um, and to help others, which I think is why I'm like super proud of like the live streams and the Isaiah 117 house moments in particular. And I just love that we have such a giving charitable, like heart to our culture here at foundation too. So that's maybe less specific DJ, but there's a lot of proud things in there. Um, as well. 
Let's see. Duck, duck, Spence. What, with your growth from episode one, what would you say was the best advice you've gotten? Um, I think I kind of went over this a little earlier, but I think just uh, some basic form advice, but I think just slowing down and really thinking about shot selection has really helped. And, you know, not being afraid, I think not being afraid to do what I want to do and make my bag what I want to make it, I think is maybe the best advice because I have a lot more fun when I like what I'm throwing. I have a lot more fun when I'm like just choosing my shots and making uh, scoring well. And, um, you know, just not forgetting that I like disc golf as well. But I think those are really some of the best pieces of advice I've gotten. Corey, again, what's the best disc to wedge under a door so that you can carry all the groceries in in one trip? Oh, see, I hate this because I'm going to make a lot of people, a lot of people mad with this one. But, you know, I think I think put the Berg under and sorry, it's not I, this is not me hating the Berg, but I think with that ridge and that lip and how it dips down, you can get it really get it underneath the door to make it a good doorstop. Uh, I think it has the right shape for a good doorstop. I think it's just really, again, nothing against the Berg, but if you want a good do doorstop, I think that's what I'm going with. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably what I'm going to go with based on its shape alone. I'm not going to hate on any discs just because I want it to be a doorstop. Um, let's see. Carpenter J says, what, what is that beard routine looking like? The fellow bearded ones need to know. Well, mine looks a little ratchety right now, but um, mine's very simple. Um, I just make sure a couple times a week I'm conditioning it, letting a little conditioner soak in. Um, I try not to like really wash it more than a couple times a week just for my hair type. Um, if I am really washing my hair a lot, it gets really oily. So I try not to try, try to avoid that. I'm always balancing between washing too much and washing too little because um, of like how oily my hair gets. My wife taught me that she's really into hair. Um, I definitely, uh, I use a boar, uh, boar's hair brush. I also use a wood, an all wooden, uh, tooth comb to maybe just keep all the tangles out and, uh, comb it every morning when I wake up and keep it nice and straight and nice and, uh, soft. It's not coarse. Uh, my problem, I have it's funny, the longer my hair gets, the more curly it gets, even my like uh, my hair under this hat here. Um, so I have to like keep it straightened out if I want some uh, some good uh, bulk on my beard. Uh, other than that, nothing really special. I'll occasionally put a little oil in it, but not a lot. Like I said, my hair will do that for me. So I don't, I don't have like super dry hair. Um, so I don't really have to do much there either. Just keep it combed out. Use a couple different kinds of combs. Make sure to condition it, keep the knots out, and you're good to go. I am not a beard expert, but that is what I do for mine, Carpenter J. Caddy Daddy DGC, what made you take the jackalope out? That disc is a cheat code. That's, that's a tough subject. Um, I'm not going to fully go into why I took the jackalope out, um, but it was, it was a personal reason, and... It was just it was just time to try some other stuff out. We'll just leave it at that. I don't want to go completely into that because um, it's kind of the past, kind of over at this point. But yeah, I do miss it. But I will say, um, Halo Leopard Three is better for that spot if you haven't tried it. Because um, I w I really love the Sublime Jackalope, which I just put out by the way, uh, Mint did. Uh, but the Halo Leopard Three really um, made me not miss the Jackalope so much anymore. So if those of you who have I've tried the jackalope, but you're like, maybe not for me or haven't tried the jackalope, um, but need that like flippy disc that will come back and have some fade at the very end of the flight. That's what I always love about the jackalope. At the very end of the flight, it came back for me, um, even after flipping up and turning. So um, maybe one day we'll talk about it. All right, guys, we're, we're going to wrap up here with a few more questions. Uh, sorry, this became a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, hopefully you all enjoy and sorry if I'm rambling, but... Uh, here we go. Uh, let's see. Not a question for Brad, but do you want to sell those foundation stamp PX3s you got? Well, there's no foundation stamp PX3s, but there's PA3s, and uh, they're all sold. We did a text deal. If you're not signed up for our text deals, Clinton, then 
sign up because we let those go very quickly. Um, we bought some extra just for that case. All business pod, let's go. H hoop. All business pod, let's go. What has the experience been like working in disc golf as a beginner? I tell you what, as a beginner working in the disc golf space, I had to get very knowledgeable very quickly or get left behind. It just seemed like new plastic, new discs were coming out every day. So I spent a lot of time like walking around feeling discs, looking at their flight numbers, throwing them. That's why warehouse guys throw discs. You don't have to exist. That's why this podcast exists. That's why I have this shelf, two Heiser racks behind me and one at the house, uh, almost full because I'm just trying to like learn. Um, this isn't just like a, it's a very fun job, but there's a lot of research and we take it very seriously and we want to give good advice as part of our mission is to give new players good access and good advice. Um, so I had to learn very quickly, I guess is a short answer to that question. And it was a little overwhelming at first, especially learning like not only like the customer like playing side, but also the back end side of it from a business standpoint. So it was very different in the world that I was in, in the um, audiology and ENT world. So it was a little bit of a learning curve, but we made it through. These are kind of going to be some rapid fire ones here. What's the theme for the monthly box this month? Uh, the monthly box this month is oldies, but goodies. So these are discs you probably haven't thrown. They're a little older, uh, molds that are a little older, but we gave them a new twist for you. There's, this is really teasing. And there's a disc that some of you have the chance of doing that is a classic. It is 20 years old. Um, very, I mean, they are so cool. So hopefully some of you get those in kind of this random lottery, uh, but very solid box. The swag items are pretty sick this, this month too. Um, so Michael can't game said, is he doing good? That all that, that all that matters can't do business if he's not Brad, Michael, appreciate you, man. Um, I'm doing, I'm doing really good. I, um, life is life, but Hey, um, I try to wake up and be grateful for what I do every, every day. I have a beautiful family. Um, I get to do disc golf. And even when I'm stressed, you know, my wife usually helps me be humble and says, Hey, by the way, you're talking about Frisbees, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Um, so doing well, uh, you know, we're doing, we're fostering a child right now as well. Uh, one year old. So that's been a big, uh, curve back into the, the baby game, but, um, my other two are 12 and 10 to, to give you a uh, spacing there. So that's been uh, an adjustment, but a great adjustment. It's been so fun and such a cool experience. Um, but yeah, I um, got through the winter doing some renovations at the house, doing some disc golf, you know, staying good. But Michael, appreciate you, man. Thank you for asking. Um, I am good as a human and uh, business is going well over here. So everything is all good. And last but not least, uh, T Wob Yorn DG. T Wob Yorn DG. Sorry if I'm butchering that. What's the best tip you've gotten to help your game the most? I think the best tip I've gotten is if it's good, keep it in the bag. I think that's the best tip I've gotten. And that's what we do on this podcast. So uh, thank you all for listening uh, to me answer some questions this q a again it was a little longer than i expected it to be and uh sorry that it took so long but i hope you all enjoyed hopefully i had some good information um i won't go completely through on like what's new in the warehouse we do have ledgestone dropping if you're hearing this ledgestone has dropped we have the nord and the berg x that have come out we did some trilogy restock we have um a bunch of new shirts as well um these windbreakers that i'm wearing right now those are available. We have Tour Life and Grip Lock merch, Bogey Bros merch going up. We also have a ton of patches. So if you're a dark horse person, and so we have these two dark horse patches here, an American one and a gray one. We have a Yuli Horse, Tour Life, Grip Locked, Bogey Bros. And hey, we have it in the bag patch as well. So make sure you pick all the pick one of those up or a bunch of them up uh, this weekend. Again, we thank you all. If you're near MCO or going to MCO, make sure you check out Jason and the tent down there. Hunter will be down there as well. Uh, we have some exclusive discs, including Robbie C. Wizard, the new blend. Not the new blend, but the new new blend down there. Some Robbie C. Pigs, some exclusive Dark Horse discs. So make sure you go down and check it out. While you're out, shop around stores or you're buying stuff online. If it's good, make sure you put it on your bag, keep it in your bag. We'll see you all next week for 100. 100.